Today, we're going to talk about media effects theories, specifically media dependency theory and the cultivation theory. The media dependency theory is a systematic approach to study of mass media effects on audiences and of the interaction between media, audiences, and social systems. This theory was developed by two American theorists, Sandra Ball Rokich and Melvin DeFleur. So basically, the theory tells us that the greater the number of social functions performed for an audience by a medium and the greater instability of a society, the greater the audience's dependency on the media and therefore the greater potential effects of the media on the audience. In other words, if there is a crisis, like for example, um, a typhoon or hurricane, um, or now during the elections, so there is um, a situation in the country the more people would be interested in knowing what's happening, the more dependent they are on media. And therefore, media can now have greater influence on their actions and their decisions. Basically, the theory tells us that there are three types of effects on the audience, the cognitive, the affective, and behavioral. Let's tackle each one. When we talk about cognitive effects, we're talking about the changes in an audience's attitudes, beliefs, and values, including changes brought about by the media. Um, for one thing, it can resolve or create ambiguity. For example, when media gives us incomplete information, it causes us stress. But when it gives us the information that we are seeking, it relieves us. For example, if you are still undecided about the current elections, then by looking at media sources, you can perhaps make a better decision on who to vote for. Then it can set the agenda or it reinforces agenda setting. Because the greater dependency on media, the more susceptible the audience is to the agenda of uh, the media or the medium. It also contributes to attitude formation, the attitude we have to a certain situation, um, event, or um, uh, just the popular sentiment. Can we would be more susceptible to, to that if our dependency on media is greater? And finally, value clarification or conflict. The value conflicts are identified, resulting in audiences forming their own value positions. When we talk about affective effects, we are talking about effects arising from or influencing our feelings and emotions. For example, um, one of the effects could be desensitization. When, um, for example, if there's too much violence, on television, then it becomes like normal to us and we're not as effect affected. Um, and sometimes we can even ignore, let's say, news, uh, news items that should actually alarm us. Uh, but because we've been desensitized, for example, um, with regards to the continuing coverage of the drug war, Perhaps at the beginning, we are bothered by it, but afterwards, it's, we can even ignore it um, because of this effect. Or it can result in, a, in feelings of fear or anxiety, meaning that it can also cause, instead of being desensitized, it can also cause fear um, that, that it can even lead to, um, you know, um, not wanting, for example, the news about COVID and its um, seriousness could have uh, prevented us from even wanting to go out of our house. So um, depending on how we see the information or how we um, pro process the information from media can affect how we uh, make decisions or act. Behavioral effects is more of like when media uh, takes the role of a stimulus. 
um, wanting to make us act. For example, the, the co coverage of the various rallies, uh, political rallies um, going on during an election period may, if we were at the beginning either indifferent or we really did not plan to join any rallies, but if we see that people are having fun and um, are being very um, solid, united, um, you know, going out there and voicing their opinion, then we might be encouraged to join them because of the media coverage. Or it can lead us to the opposite extreme. Again, it can, it can activate or deactivate our, our feelings or response. So, for example, it can uh, result in being turned off by uh, certain events, issues, or people. Um, it can make us uh, not want to expose ourselves. For example, if we are um, exposed, for example, to the behavior of trolls, then we can, it can result in our not wanting to give our opinion for fear of being attacked. The second theory is the cultivation theory. This theory was developed by George Gerbner in the 1960s. Basically, what happened was um, Gerbner, together with Larry Gross, who is technically not a theorist, but more of a television producer, co-directed what they called the Cultural Indicators Project, which focused on television content and its influences on viewer attitudes and behavior, and thereby introducing what we now know as the theory of cultivation. Um, so basically, they started this Cultural Indicators Project because they were commissioned by the National Violence Commission, who was alarmed by... Um, the exposure, especially of children, to, to violence on, on primetime news, on primetime crime shows, etc. And they wanted to study uh, the media effects. So basically, from this model, we see that um, they're looking at the effects of TV viewing and um, its effects and its, how it transposes to social reality. The cultivation states that high-frequency viewers of television are more susceptible to media messages and the belief that they are real and valid. The model shows that the content and message of television affect the audience perception towards the world. So, of course, in the 1960s, the um, most modern medium was the television. But now we can see um, that many uh, scholars are now trying to use uh, cultivation theory to study um, YouTube, Twitter, um, Instagram, and how it affects its, uh, its particular audiences. So cultivation research uses a three-prong analysis. The first is the institutional process analysis. This examines the policies and practices of a media institution and the reason it produces media message the way it does. So basically from this uh, level of analysis, it looks at uh, the media itself um, and even specifically um, the media outlets. For example, focusing, let's say, on ABS-CBN, on Rappler, um, on CNN um, and looking at where they're coming from and how they approach um, their programming. So it looks at the analysis of reasons why media produces the messages that they do. How does the media grab the attention of the audience? For example, in a particular, if we were doing an analysis of a particular television show, was sex and violence uh, used um, in the production of the show? Was it used to um, entice the audience to watch? For example, in a crime show, usually this is the technique that they use to 
make the audience uh, watch their shows. We could also apply this to shows that have or exhibit a particular culture. For example, if you are hooked to shows on Netflix, such as the Bridgerton series or maybe K-drama, how does, what is the media message of these shows and how does it affect the audience that watches it? The second level of study is the message system analysis. This looks at the systematic study of TV content, more from a quantitative content analysis of the television program. So after studying where the um, media um, production is coming from or the point of view of the media producers, it now looks at its actual content. So the premise is that media cultivates perceptions in the audience and that the message system analysis focus on the type of messages the media sends to their audiences, such as uh, looking, you can look at gender roles, the attitudes about science, attitudes about work or marriage, um, the environment, or even political views. So the types of messages are analyzed to ascertain the connection between the perceptions and the amount of content in the media presentation. So the third prong is the cultivation analysis. So this shows how TV content affects the viewers, especially those who watch television um, for a longer period. So it's designed to determine how likely our audiences to see reality based on media consumption. So basically, it, see, it looks at whether the audience now uses the media lens in deciding or even in viewing the world around them. So, for example, if you watch a lot of crime shows, perhaps you already are, uh, or you already feel that your own society is not safe um, and that uh, you have a fear of the, being uh, victimized. So the third prong is basically the meat of the theory because this prong determines the influence of the content on the individual perception about their environment. The difference between the cultivation analysis and the message analysis is based on the perception of the individuals as opposed to the content of the messages being sent. So another idea promoted in this analysis is the direct relationship between the amount of time an individual is engrossed in the media and the influence on the person's perception of their environment. That is, the individual views of their world through a media lens. Corollary to the theory are some other sub-themes uh, of the cultivation theory starting with mainstreaming. So what do we mean by mainstreaming? So when um, it's cultivated in the audience and the audience is already uh, very much into what they are watching, then it becomes something that is no longer on the periphery but may, has become mainstream. It implies that heavy television viewing contributes to an erosion of differences in people's perspective that stems from other factors or influences. So um, because of heavy TV viewing, they are more influenced by what they see on television than what is actually happening or what they read perhaps in newspapers or what their uh, family or friends tell them. So all other things become secondary influencers and media becomes the primary one. People who otherwise have little in common besides television are brought into the same dominant mainstream by cumulative heavy viewing. So, um, and this is done sometimes vicariously, meaning that you might not be the heavy viewer, but if somebody in your house is or if among your friends. So for example, uh, language. You know, when we have new words in our, um, you know, the jargon that we use, 
um, in conversation. Sometimes we pick it up, let's say, from new known shows, you know, like words that have been coined, um, sometimes even fads or trends. Why are they, why did it become mainstream? Because it's picked up by popular television and therefore becomes part of popular culture. So among light viewers, people who differ in terms of background factors such as age, education, social class, political orientations, and even region of residence, tend to have sharply different conceptions of social reality regarding violence, interpersonal mistrust, gender role stereotypes, and a broad range of political or social outlooks. Yet among heavy viewers, across those same groups, those differences tend to be much smaller or even disappear entirely. Another concept is resonance. Um, this occurs when a media message is boosted by a significant segment of society, especially viewers' lived experience. And this is now exacerbated, I think, by the influence of social media. When we look at um, our, the, the posts on Facebook or the vlogs on YouTube, then we see or what media tells us can be reinforced by the viewer's lived experience, plus our own, own experiences. So um, this provides a double dose of the message conveyed on television. For example, a person has a bad experience about vaccination and is exposed to a lot of fake news and conspiracy theories against the COVID vax, then that person can become an anti-vaxxer. So between the television message and the real-life anecdotal experience, cultivation effects can be amplified, enhancing whatever beliefs one already holds. And lastly, the mean world syndrome. This um, happened or was experimented on by in the 1980s by Gerbner, who also coined the term, meaning that to describe the cognitive basis whereby television viewers exposed especially to violent content were more likely to see the world as more dangerous than it actually is. So what are the examples of media effects theory research, especially um, cultivation and media dependency theories? So there are many cross-disciplinary studies. No? They're not only um, used by um, communication um, scholars, but also used by political scientists and psychologists. So, for example, the study of political campaign communication, uh, the influence of the news coverage on candidates, campaign ads, media bias, and social media preference or social media presence, um, public relations and advertising. So, for example, um, product placement in TV shows and film, when it's not obviously an advertisement, you know, but is used, for example, you are hooked to a particular TV show and that um, character that you like very much in the TV show always uses um, this particular brand. Then most likely when you go shopping, you would be looking for that brand as well. Celebrity endorsements, media branding. So this is cultivation uh, theory helps integrated marketing techniques in terms of marketing uh, products. Cultural studies, for example, the Hallyu phenomenon or the K-pop phenomenon, so the, or the Korean wave rather, is an example of a media effects. And, can, and this particular, these, these theories can be used to study it. Users and gratification studies are basically re, or reinforces cultivation theory. Studies as well on self-esteem um, and the use of social media can be among the studies that looks into media effects. And crisis communication, for example, disaster reportage, uh, the COVID crisis. So these are ideal topics for media effects 
um, studies. So basically, that's it. I hope that this lecture has helped you understand media effects theories, or at least the two most popular ones. Mm -hmm.